grace and mercy. Uh, it is good to be with you virtually this morning. Uh, we uh, were hoping against hope with the rain this morning and just decided we were had too much to uh, try to get ready before service, uh, that it just was not going to happen today in the park. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook and you're thinking, well, maybe I can come to the church. Well, you know, this is a test Sunday for us. We do have some things ready, but not everything is ready. And so if you came, you, you probably wouldn't know what to do uh, in coming in. But we're wearing masks in the sanctuary, and we are uh, hand sanitizing in the door and all that. So some of that stuff is ready, and the pews are marked. I don't know if you can see the tape that's on the pews. But we're just not quite there yet to be able to say, hey, this is our fallback location. So we are virtual this morning. Uh, if you're new watching us this morning, please take a moment to go ahead and uh, type a, a hello to us so we can uh, say hello back to you. Uh, we'd love the opportunity to follow up with you sometime so you can direct message us, uh, email or phone number or something like that, and we will get back to hold of you because we'd like to say hello. Uh, mark your calendars because kickoff Sunday is September 13th. Back to Church Sunday is the next Sunday, September 20th. Those are two different things, and you'll hear more about those soon. And New Consecration Sunday is October 4th. So it's not really back to back to back, but it's really close together there. And more will come about these days in the future uh, as uh, we go on. Uh, as we continue to prepare for the return to the sanctuary, we're going to be ramping up full programming. And anyone that is interested in teaching classes or leading some groups needs to speak with April or myself. Uh, I'm excited about the classes that are coming up, and we also have an opportunity uh, to do some virtual classes this year uh, that, that we didn't have last year. We're all set and ready for that, and uh, along with that, this isn't another case where you're going to be doing remote learning with your students uh, and your kids. This is where we will continue to give you an opportunity to relax and, and give you the material, and the kids will do that by video, and uh, all you have to do is help your non-readers read the story. So I'm excited about all those and how we can uh, also be forming young lives in after Christ. Uh, Hezekiah's faith was continued to be nurtured by several different passages uh, of scripture that he preserved, and his decisions were made using uh, the passages this morning that are our focus. Cindy? Proverbs 27, verses 8 through 12. Like a bird that strays from its nest is one who strays from home. Perfume and incense make the heart glad, but the soul is torn by trouble. Do not forsake your friend or the friend of your parent. Do not go to the house of your kindred on the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is nearby than kindred who are far away. Be wise, my child. And make my heart glad, so that I may answer whoever reproaches me. The clever seek danger and hide, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Let's pray. Lord, today we recall your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us in each moment. Thank you that your promises are true and your goodness never fails us. In this moment, we come to you and we lay our lives before you. May we worship and adore you with every fiber of our being. May everything within us cry, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And so today we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord, from generations past and present, and with all the angels that sing in the heaven of your greatness and beauty. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Lord, you are so precious to us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now let's continue our worship as we sing and join in the opening song, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Good morning, boys and girls. How are you doing this morning out there in virtual land and those couple that are with us this morning? Today we're going to talk about choices. So what does it mean to make a choice? A choice is a decision when you're faced with two or more different things that you could think about doing. Last weekend, I had a conversation with my five-year-old daughter, granddaughter, Sullivan. And she said to me, sometimes you just have to make a choice, and whatever you choose is okay. And while that's partly right, um, it was definitely right in her situation, Sullivan struggles with deciding what she's going to wear in the morning. <laughs> and so she has heard her parents say to her, sometimes you just have to choose and whatever choice you make is going to be just fine have you ever been in that situation it doesn't matter whether you're wearing the pink dress with the hearts on it or the purple dress with the flowers just choose one and it will be just fine and then i have a friend on facebook who i really like a lot and one of her um, things that she did this week was to take her children to visit a new ice cream shop that they had heard about. And when they got there, she replied, man, there are a lot of choices here. So what kind of ice cream, those of you that are out there, would you choose if you had the option to choose? Strawberry. Strawberry. Neapolitan. Neapolitan. Mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip. Yeah, there's all kinds of choices, and it really doesn't matter which of those choices you make. What did you have? Chocolate chip. Chocolate chip. Yum. <laughs> so you can choose any one of those things that you want, and it's what you like, so that's okay. But some choices aren't as easy, and they aren't based on what we want as much as what is the right thing that we do. What is the right thing to do? So like if your parents say, I want you to take out the garbage, you could choose to do it or not do it. But probably it's a good idea to take out the garbage. And the Bible tells us that we should obey our parents and do those things. Plus, it helps our family, right? So we gain wisdom from the Bible in those situations. I usually feel like I can make pretty good decisions and choices on my own. But to be honest, some really tough choices, I need to invite God into those decisions and depend on him to help me make those choices. And the way that I depend on God is to go to church, to learn about the teachings of the Bible, to read the Bible, and then, of course, to pray to God about the decision that I have to make. And all of this is to help me to learn about the truth and about what the right thing is to do. But prayer definitely is very important. So when you need to make a tough decision, like whether or not you should be nice to the kid who's been mean to you, or whether or not you should give part of your allowance to the offering, or those kinds of things. We have to remember that we need to love others and be kind, and those are the things that we learn from God's word. So let's um, think about that as we make decisions that we can involve God in the choices that we make, especially the tough decisions of life. Let's pray. Dear God, Help us to depend on you, to pray to you about our choices and our decisions. And we know that you are with us and you will help us with those choices. In thy name we pray. Amen. So I'm checking the Facebook feed. checking the Facebook feed to see um, if there are any prayers, and we have prayers for students and for teachers. Also, uh, want to let you know, one that came into the office earlier this week, Cal Green um, is uh, been dealing with cancer uh, diagnosis, and uh, he just heard from the uh, doctors their recommendations, and is choosing to go on hospice care. Um, so, uh, he, he meets with his uh, general practitioner soon. Uh, I, uh, I can't remember if that was Friday or if it was supposed to be early this coming week, but uh, they're going to be making arrangements uh, for that. And 
he's hoping to be able to stay at home uh, during this time. So please be in prayer for him. I know his uh, children are spread throughout the country, uh, but they have done their best to arrange their schedules and to commit that uh, at least one of them is staying with him at this time. Uh, and so we pray for them and their travels as they travel back and forth to be with dad, and also for him as he goes through this uh, time of cancer and hospice care. Uh, I'm sure there are some other prayer requests out there. Unfortunately, uh, during the rush around this morning, uh, and uh, changing from park to here, I am missing some of my notes. So I apologize for missing some of those prayer requests, but God knows all of our requests, whether they are spoken or unspoken, or uh, with the note is with us or not. So let us pray uh, this morning as we hear the words of encouragement from Christ. Uh, when we face struggles in this life, he said in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let us take a few moments of silent prayer as we reach out to God our provider. God, we come to you in the middle of the struggles and cares of this world. Life is not easy here. But we lay our lives before you, knowing that you, we can depend on you and your care. We trust not in ourselves, not in human institutions, but in the only living God. So, Lord, it's to you that we lift up those whose names and situations have been laid on our hearts. We pray for our family and friends, especially those who are going back to school and the teachers who are teaching. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with them that you would give them protection from the virus and give them calmness from the anxiety that they experience. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Cal and his family. We ask, Lord, that in your time, it would be his time to go. It would not be sooner. We ask that you would give him strength for these days ahead to be with his family. That they may share sweet and precious moments together. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with all those who experienced the major amount of rain we had in our area. We thank you for watering the ground. Uh, it was a lot at once. And some experienced flooding and other issues from it. So we pray, Lord, for them and for their quick recovery. We pray that any storm damage is quickly taken care of. And we're thankful, Lord, for many hands that make light work of the messes that were made from the wind. Guide us, Lord, and direct us, and all those who seek after you, even as we pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
the good king Hezekiah, he had made several decisions. The first was to get rid of all idol worship in the kingdom, including that bronze snake that Moses had made, that God commanded him to make, and the Israelites began to misuse. He rejected Assyria, the kingdom to the north, as a protector, seeking to depend only on God. He crushed the Philistine army. Then the northern kingdom fell, and the Assyrians turned their eyes on Judah. Hezekiah tried to appease them with tons of silver and gold. Then Snetreb sent his field commander to threaten Jerusalem. As we open to 2 Kings 19, Jerusalem's in trouble. And all of the surrounding hill country of Judea has already been captured by the Assyrians, and Jerusalem itself is under siege. The end is near. The signs are on the street. The stress and despair are on every side and on every heart. But the prophet Isaiah says that God has a plan in all of this and would deliver them from the Assyrians. And what happens next makes history. 2 Kings 19, verses 9 through 19. When the king heard concerning King Teraka of Ethiopia, see, he has set out to fight against you. He sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to King Hezekiah of Judah. Do not let your God, on whom you rely, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the kings of Assyria. See, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them utterly. Shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my predecessors destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharim, the king of Hena, or the king of Iba? Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. The Hez then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have hurled their gods into the fire, though they were no gods but the work of human hands, hands, wood, and stone, and so they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us, I pray you, from this hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When... The Nazis seemed unstoppable back at World War II, and the British people were ready to cave in, uh, even without a single Nazi troop landing on the British Isles. BBC Radio decided that if they were going to win, they needed to encourage the people, and so they hired C.S. Lewis to come and to strengthen the faith of the people by recording what later became the book Mere Christianity. It's said that during the darkest days of the Revolutionary War, uh, 200 years ago, while the army was suffering the Winter Valley Forge, George Washington, above all else, turned to prayer. When the chips are down, when all is but lost, when we have nowhere else to go, we turn to a last resort, a final refuge. We turn to God, who is our mighty fortress, the one to whom we believe can keep what we've committed. As I've surveyed this part of Hezekiah's life, I get the distinct feeling that's not what is happening here, though. Nothing against George Washington or C.S. Lewis. They were good and godly men, and I don't think that they were trying to say that God was the last resort. I think they were actually following Hezekiah's example here today as not acting as if God is the last resort. It does feel sometimes like we treat God as the last resort. Well, we've stopped paying the Assyrians, built up our army, fortified our towns. Yeah, we'll yawn a quick little prayer at the temple, and everything will be set. That's not what's happening here with Hezekiah. We call folks like that fair weather Christians. When things are going good, they'll have all the religion in the world. But when things start going wrong, God is the least of their concerns. 
Let's throw money at it. Let's throw our strength at it. Let's throw our smarts at it. Let's turn here or there. And only when all of these things fail and in our final desperation, we turn out to God. That doesn't describe Hezekiah. Hezekiah is like his father David. He's a man after God's own heart. He committed himself to live in the presence and glory of the Holy One of Israel. Before the Assyrians even attacked, he removed idolatry from the kingdom. He cleaned town. He was all committed to God and was extremely successful in everything he set out to do because of God's glory on his life. God came first. God was already present. God was the priority for Hezekiah. Well, that's fine. Good, you may say, Pastor. Yet Assyria was a major army. They came in so fast and powerfully that Hezekiah had no choice but to depend on God at this point. Really? Have you read the text? Hezekiah had plenty of provisions in Jerusalem. Jerusalem could have lasted several months, if not years, under siege. Perhaps long enough for the Egyptians to come and save them. The major power that the Assyrians were fighting against were the Egyptians. Hezekiah had fighting men too. They could have planned some special attack. There was a tunnel that led outside of Jerusalem that would have put them behind enemy lines. What about all the money that Hezekiah still has? He could have bought off Sinetra or at least the field commanders. Hey, just tell your boss you attacked. We've committed. There you go. Maybe some clever diplomacy. You don't want to waste your time with little old Judah. Let us be a buffer between you and the Egyptians. They're on their way, you know. Why don't you retreat and we'll protect you from them? Times are desperate. The very first thing Hezekiah does with this letter is to take it to God in prayer. You know what this letter says, right? This letter and everything that it says in it. But the first thing we need to read is what it does not say. The first thing we need to know is, is that it doesn't say, you don't have enough money to buy us off from attacking you. And Hezekiah does have a lot of money still. There's still all the gold that's laid in on the temple decorations that he could give away. There's still all that that he could do with money, but money won't do much. The second thing that's not on this list, it doesn't say, your army is so weak and pathetic and your city walls are crumbling. We can kill all your sons and take your daughters for ourselves, and not only that with a tenth of the men we have. That's probably not far from the truth. Assyria had a massive army that was able to attack Jerusalem. You know, it would probably only need a small portion to be successful at it. So that's not what this letter says. What's in the letter? Your good for nothing God is deceiving you. You think your God can save you? Look at all the peoples that have come before you. Where are their gods now? Ashes on the ground, dust spread to the wind. Don't get caught up in your worship. Your God can't save you. This letter and everything that it says, every piece of it, it says an attack on the power and majesty of the Lord God Almighty. I don't know about the rest of you, but when the world looks at a small town church, they say some things that may or may not be true, but often the first thing that comes into their mind is, looks like God has abandoned them. They don't have the kind of resources that they need to do the things they want to do. They're not like the king of Judah and everything that he had. We can't do everything we want to do because there are limitations on what we can do, although we are blessed. We don't have the human resources that Hezekiah had. One time or another, some of you have told me how you can't do the things you used to do because, well, you've gotten a little bit older. Some or others have talked about we can't do the things we used to do because there are people who just don't volunteer anymore. Wealth and strength are typically the first two signs in our society that people look at. It's what the world perceives as vitality markers, active life. God looks differently. And even the enemies of God's people know that the true power that's behind Hezekiah is not his money, nor is it his strength. Hezekiah's source and his dependence upon God is the power that he has. And this letter was a direct assault on his only lifeline that could have helped him out. 
Judah didn't have money, and Assyria didn't care about it. Judah didn't have people, and Assyria really didn't care about that. Judah had God, and Assyria was afraid, and so they wrote the letter. You don't need to remind me that any congregation has finite resources on whatever it may have and want to do. We're good for now, by the way. We have a balanced future ahead of us. Uh, it's just not infinite. You don't need to tell me that people struggle to be able to get involved with an active in ministry, that schedules are busy. We don't need somebody to tell us any of that. They're quite evident and obvious. When the world or the devil though, attacks us, it's not directed at our finances. It's directed at the God who blesses us with those finances. When the world or the devil attacks us, it's not directed at our strength or our people resources. It's directed at the one and only God that empowers even bleach and dry bones to come back to life and dance in the middle of the desert just by the breath of his Holy Spirit. Depending on God requires tough choices. First and foremost, it requires that we maintain our faith and allegiance to Jesus Christ. We get nowhere looking for help from another source. Secondly, if we're maintaining our faith and allegiance to Jesus Christ, it means we're going to act like it. It means we're going to keep doing the work that he has called us to do. Even when the money doesn't add up, we're still going to do it because God is faithful to those who trust him. Even when it seems like our strength won't hold up and we have used every last ounce of energy we have, we're going to continue to lift Jesus higher and higher because God is faithful to those who trust in him. Thirdly, when the world laughs at us and says, if God's so faithful, then why are you in that situation to begin with? We're going to realize that that's a doubt in the ability of God to use his church, to use his people, to use you and me. We're going to take their doubts and we're going to run up to the cross and we're going to proclaim you are our God and we know that you are faithful and we're going to keep on trusting you and we're going to keep on acting like those who trust you so that you can prove yourself to the world and bring glory to your name and to your son, Jesus Christ. When all of the odds are against God's will, that's when miracles happen. Yet only when his people trust him. As the story continues in 2 Kings chapter 19, it picks up this in verse 35. This is the very end of that chapter, the very end of the story of Sennacherib. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. <coughs> And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Symmetra, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived in Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrach, his god, Adrimelech and Sherazar, his sons, struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And Ashrerodon, his son, reigned in his place. For all of his big boasting, Sennacherib surely failed at his task. God will defend his people. Do you know the story of Tintino? Have, have, have any of you heard about his life? His parents were missionaries in the Philippines when his mother contracted dysentery. They put her on some very, very powerful antibiotics and then later found out that she was pregnant with Tim. The drugs were dangerous for a baby, and the doctor said it's too late. The damage had already been done. It's best to have an abortion now. Pan's health was at greater and greater risk as the pregnancy went on, and they said the baby would never survive or would be severely handicapped anyway. Being people of faith, Bob and Pam Tebow, though, said, we will keep this child for as long as God allows it. She stayed in the hospital on bed rest for two months as they anxiously awaited the arrival of this precious child that they prayed for moment by moment. After Tim's birth, 
They looked at the placenta and they noticed that it was obviously only been attached by a little tiny portion, just enough to keep Tim alive during the final months of gestation. He was a little malnourished then, but if you've seen him on the field in performances in football or baseball, you would not say he's malnourished now. But you realize that God is faithful to those who trust him. Praise be to God for faith that not only depends on God's trustworthiness, praise God for faith that makes the tough choice to act on that dependence. We have the opportunity as believers in Jesus Christ to go to him first. Before all of the human means that are available to us like money and people and our smarts, and we shouldn't just talk about faith in Jesus Christ. We should act on the trustworthiness of God, taking full advantage of the power of the Holy Spirit that's within us, and make tough choices and say that you are God alone, and we believe you will make yourself known to the world through us by the power and wonder of your mighty hand. If you believe that, if you have faith that to trust in Jesus Christ, then to make a tough decision, that means you truly trust. In him. Let your actions flow from your trust in Jesus Christ. Even when the humanly pos possible options are still available to you, let's go to the Lord first and seriously ask, meaning before we make any other decisions, which choice he blesses. Let's assume that everything we could do in our own strength and in our own resources is the wrong decision and worthless to the situation. Because God is capable of so much more. And as we are too, when we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's go that way first, because that's what people of faith do. Amen. Oh uh -huh.
Now, may the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ His Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always, and fill the pages of your life with a story that's just too good not to share. Amen. Thank you.